right, welcome to the second episode in our podcast today, uh, which is going to be discussing that first flying lesson, uh, which will be based on the effects of controls flight. All right, so this is assuming that you've already gone out, you've had your trial introductory flight, you've signed up for the flying lesson, uh, flying lessons, sorry, uh, and you've decided to make a go of this, whether it be in regards to an RPL, a PPL, or as the uh, first flight on your journey to a commercial pilot license. Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, so quickly, before we start the briefing, I just want to go through with you how you should have prepared for this flight. All right, so the importance of you doing a little bit of work outside of the flight school to get the most out of your experience. All right, so preparing for that first flight is really, really important. It's going to get you into the right headspace. All right, it's going to kind of put you one step ahead of the aircraft. All right, to use a really, really uh, popular term that you're going to be have drilled into you, stay ahead of the aircraft. All right, that includes on the ground and in a theory. Uh, so use those textbooks that the tri that the flight school would have tried to flog you off uh, when you signed up. All right. So if it was the ATC student pilot kit, or whether it was Bob Tate, or whether it was some in-house uh, uh, theory program, uh, they would have provided you with something. Uh, if they haven't, uh, Google's your best friend, um, or you can just kind of sit back and enjoy this this video podcast. All right. And we'll go through the basics, the real basics of what. Uh, to expect in your first flying lesson. Uh, and then what we're gonna do, we're gonna kind of step you through this effects of controls briefing. So what this is, this is the briefing that I designed uh, when I was learning to be a flying instructor, you know, four odd years ago. Uh, so I haven't really had a look at this briefing in a very long time. Um, so there might be some interesting, interesting points in here that we can go through uh, together. All right, so the flow of a long brief. So when you arrive at the airport uh, for your flying lessons, generally the way it'll work is you'll have a long briefing, which focuses on the kind of theoretical aspect of the upcoming flight. Uh, you, that'll be half an hour, kind of 45 minutes. You'll then have a pre-flight briefing, which is you know 10 to 15 minutes. And that's generally used to kind of check your knowledge from the long brief and to also kind of go through exactly what you're going to be covering in the flight, so the practical aspects of it. So all in all, you know, the ground time for an hour flight is about an hour, all right? So it's about a one-to-one -one, uh, in these early stages of your flight training. Uh, as you progress through the training, the ground time before the flight will end up being longer than the flight itself, all right? so. Even from the next lesson, you know, which is going to be straight and level, followed by climbing, descending, turning. All right, there's going to be periods where you should be spending, you know, another hour at home for each hour of flying. All right, so you'll get to the point where it's kind of an hour at home, an hour on the ground before the flight, and then an hour flight. All right, and that's that's really really important if you're to get the the value for money out of your flight training. All right, really really important. Um. So if you've got a, a 10 a.m. flight, you know, you'll be arriving at the airport sometime around 8.30, all right, for, for the pre-flight briefing, the long briefing, then the pre-flighting of the aircraft, you know, to be turning that key, you know, at 10 o'clock, you know, it's a 10 past 10, all right? So you, you don't want to be known as that student that's always running late, all right? Um, because we do have them all, and, and first of all, you know, especially if your first flight of the day you'll throw out the whole day and it's not fair on anybody who comes after you. Uh, and you know, if you're the afternoon flight and you're, you've got a 3.30 booking and you know you walk in at, at you know quarter past three or whatever it might be, uh, and you see that the other, the other student is just walking out to the plane you know, and you've got to sit there and wait for an hour while you know, to your private hire, once you get your license till they come back, you're not gonna be overly happy, all right? Um, so yeah, you've walked in oh, for your first lesson. You know, you got a ten a.m. booking. It's kind of eight thirty. You've strolled on in. You know, you've had a you've, you've met the the lady or the man on the front desk. You know, you're starting to build that relationship already. All right. So they're they're going to be your generally be your point of call with the school. Um, really important to build that relationship with whoever's manning the desk uh, at at your flight school. Um, they'll be able to help you just as much as your instructor. 
all right? When you need something, you know, when you call and they answer, you know, you wanna make sure that you've already built that relationship there. Uh, and, and then obviously your instructor will come and grab you and they'll kind of walk you through what these lessons up into your RPL are gonna look like. Uh, so we're gonna kind of jump ahead now and you, you've you know, had your cup of tea, cup of coffee, whatever it might be, uh, and you're in the classroom, you're, you're ready to rock and roll. Uh, this is the first briefing. So let's have a look here at the effects of controls brief. So effects of controls, now, these long briefs will generally all follow a very similar kind of flow. So when we're designing these briefs uh, during our instructor course, uh, it's set out in such a way uh, to marry up with what's known as a principle and a method of instruction. So the Aviation Authority CASA kind of outlines, you know, that these are the general uh, things that each of these briefs must include. And it, you know, it includes something like an introduction, an aim, objectives, definitions, uh, and the body of the briefing. All right, so no matter where you go, you'll see some form of, of PowerPoint presentation. Uh, pretty much all of them are PowerPoint presentations now uh, that have a flow something like this. So the introduction, so to fly an aeroplane, the pilot must know what controls are provided, have an understanding of how they work, and know what effects each control will have on the flight of that aeroplane. All right, so a really high level, basic introduction to the brief. Now the aim. So the aim is what the instructor is hoping for you to achieve by the end of this briefing, all right? It's an immediate aim, all right? So the aim for this briefing is for you to understand the movements, effects, and further effects on an aeroplane uh, of an aeroplane, sorry, primary and ancillary controls. Um, now, so this brief here in this aim, this was taken straight out of a handout that I, that I was given as part of my instructor rating. And you'll see this as we move through these briefs as part of this RPL series. You'll see, you know, uh, when I was doing my instructor rating and the school I did it at, the way it worked was the early briefs, so such as effects of controls and straight and level, we were given a lot of content for it. And as the briefings progressed, you know, we were expected to build more and more of that brief ourselves. So you'll see, you know, more and more of, you know, my personality coming into the briefs, the further uh, into the course we get. Uh, and you'll see that, you know, my interpretation of a briefing is much more that the brief and the PowerPoint presentation, sorry, uh, should be a guide for discussion. Uh, and the instructor who is delivering the brief is what really uh, passes on that knowledge. So my, my slide shows are very basic um, and they include more just guided discussion points for myself as well as uh, things that will reinforce any point that I might be trying to make or any you know piece of information that I'm trying to get across to you as the student. Um, but this brief here is very generic uh, and it pretty much comes straight out of a, a, a handout I was given. So, so as we'll go through, you know, I'll point out some of the things that, you know, I would now do differently and some of the things, you know, that are still really, really, really relevant. Um, so after the aim is the overview. So this is where we're going to have a look at exactly what's going to be covered in the briefing today. Uh, so the lesson will be about 45 minutes long. So a long brief will generally be somewhere in the region of kind of 35 to 45 minutes. Uh, any more than 45 minutes, you know, and anyone who's sitting in a classroom for that long is kind of tuning out. Uh, so you want to try and keep these briefings to about 45 minutes. If they are going to go longer, you know, generally you, you, you may be offered, you know, a little break or something like that to go and stretch your legs. Uh, and we're going to cover uh, topics including the axis of motion, air deflection, primary and secondary effects of control inputs, slipstream, I can't even spell stream, that's embarrassing. Here's the first one I found. Uh, ancillary controls, airmanship, and threat and error management. So those last two points there, so airmanship and threat and error management, uh, you'll see those terms come up constantly from day one being this briefing all the way through to the end of your training, whether that be RPL, PPL, CPL, you know, whatever, you know, those two terms always show up again and again, all right? And at the end of the briefing, we'll go through what they actually are. Uh, so the objectives. So the objectives for a briefing need to be smart objectives, all right? So they need to be specific, they need to be measurable, 
achievable, realistic, you know, and be able to be achieved in the time frame. So for us today, that's only about 30 minutes. So they're not going to be long-term objectives. Once again, they are immediate objectives. Uh, so the first one here is to identify the flight controls and their axis of movement correctly. State primary and secondary effects of control around the three axis from memory and without error. Describe how control effectiveness varies with airspeed. State correctly from memory the purpose and use of flaps, trim and carburetor heat and factors affecting the total reaction. Now, looking back at these objectives, again, these were taken straight off a handout. Now, are they uh, correct in regards to the principles and methods of instruction of these objectives being specific, you know, measurable? Yes, they are, you know, they're very specific and they're, they're worded intentionally to be very specific to prove a point to, you know, a new instructor that this is what an objective should look like. Now, uh, looking at that, for, you know, in 2020 hindsight, after kind of teaching a lot of students this lesson, they're too wordy. So as, as a student sitting there for your first lesson and going through those objectives, yeah, yes, they are smart objectives. You know, they tick all the boxes. But as we're going through the briefing, how are you going to remember, you know, oh, this is a point, oh, this is one of the objectives. I need to pay attention here. You know, I, I need to retain, you know, this bit of information. Um, it can be a bit hard when the objectives are that wordy. So, you know, so if I was redoing this again, I'd probably uh, keep the objectives but reword them in such a way that was uh, a bit more relevant, a bit more easy to absorb um, in the you know, kind of semi-stressful environment that's your first briefing. Um, or you can get the student to, you know, you may feel maybe if you write them down, you know, at, at this point so you can kind of refer to them during the briefing. Um, you know, or you take a photo of them on the board or whatever it might be. Um, if you do find uh, there are wordy objectives up there. Um, so the next slide here is definitions. Now, as an instructor, I always spent a, a fair bit of time on definitions. I found it was a really, really important slide. Um, because if you don't understand the terms and the words that have been used during the brief, uh, you, you have no chance, you have no hope of understanding the actual, you know, concepts that we're trying to convey. So the definitions are really, again, specific to the briefing of the day. Uh, they're really quite general. You'll maybe have kind of four to eight, depending on uh, what briefing it is. And these are definitely terms that, you know, if you are somebody who, you know, learns by writing, definitely, you know, take this opportunity to kind of write the word, write the definition, you know, and anything else that your instructor may go through with you. So for me, for this briefing, uh, the first one was horizon. And horizon is simply where the sky meets the ground. Now, we could stop and we could move right on to the next definition now, okay? But what I find uh, very helpful is to spend just a minute kind of going a little bit more in depth uh, with these definitions to make sure that A, the student understands, and B, is there any value I can add to the definition at this stage that will uh, make my life and the student's life easier down the track, all right? And something like horizon, yes, there is. All right, I can add some value to this definition all right, on the first day, in the first 15 minutes of their first briefing, that's going to make my life easier, that's going to make the student's life easier in three or four flights to come. And that is by pointing out you know, exactly how the horizon relates to me sitting in the aircraft. So to do that, you know, I always grab the model, I drew a line on the whiteboard you know, and said, all right, you know, we've got the trees and the mountains below the line, we have the sky above the line, all right? Again, really, really basic. I then flew the model aeroplane into the whiteboard and put the spinner on the line, all right? And I said, all right, so you can see here, you know, when we're sitting in the plane, the sky should be above us, the ground should be below us, all right? At this stage anyway, all right? I then turned the aircraft and rotated the aircraft, you know, kind of 360 degrees in my hand and said, well, if I'm now flying you know, parallel to the whiteboard and I've got the right wingtip sitting on the horizon there, if I look out to the right, I've still got horizon there, don't I? You know, yes, I do. I would also still have horizon straight in front of me. All right? And then I'd turn the aircraft again and put the tail on the whiteboard and say, oh, well, look at that. The horizon's behind me. The horizon would still be out in front of me. The horizon would still be off under my right wing, you know, if we're flying a 
a high wing 172. And to do that, the whole idea of that is to understand the horizon is 360 degrees around the aircraft. So when we get to the turning or the steep turning lesson, and the whole kind of point of that flight is to hold a reference point on the horizon constant in your windscreen, you know, or to pick a, a point on the dashboard or something, you know, to hold constant against the horizon in the turn, that you understand, you know, why we're doing that. Because the horizon is, you know, for the sake of our exercise today, a constant 360 degrees around the aircraft, all right, excluding things like mountains and clouds or, or whatever. The second definition we can see there is attitude. So what is attitude? So attitude is the relationship between the nose of the aircraft and the horizon, all right? So what we're doing here is we've started with horizon, we're now building on it. So a concept that you'll become uh, familiar with or you may, you, you may pick up on as part of your training is it's always gonna be a movement from the known to the unknown. All right, so we're always going to take a concept that we've taught you before and develop it into something else. All right, we're never going to you know, be flying blind into a, into a new topic without first uh, giving you a known to build upon. All right, so and this is just a really, ba it's just a really basic uh, example of it there, horizon to attitude. So attitude, the relationship between the nose of the aircraft and the horizon. So here I can go back with my aircraft, put my spinner back on that horizon line on the whiteboard. Pardon me. And we can start off by saying, all right, so this here, you know, is a level attitude. You know, we're not, we're not climbing, we're not descending, it's just, you know, level. Now, if we put the nose of the aircraft and we have it pointing up, so we're seeing more sky than ground. That's called a nose high attitude, you know, or a nose up attitude. And if we then push that nose down, you know, we have the nose of the aircraft now on the whiteboard below the line. You can see that we're now seeing more ground than sky. This is a nose down or a nose low attitude. All right, so very simple, you know, nose on the horizon, you know, for this example, level attitude, up, nose high attitude, down is a nose down or nose low attitude. The third definition there is relative airflow. So relative airflow is the flow of air in the opposite direction to the movement of the aircraft. So really simple, you know, I'd grab that model airplane and I'd start walking it across the front of the classroom from right to left and just say, well, if the aircraft is here moving right to left across the classroom, the relative airflow is that airflow moving from left to right, you know, over the wing of the aircraft, under the wing, hitting it on the nose in the opposite direction. Uh, and finally, an axis. So an axis is an imaginary line about, a, about which a body rotates. All right, so some people understand straight off the bat what an axis is, uh, some people don't. So if you, they don't understand, you know, all I do is I grab my water bottle here, you know, so finger on one end on the cap, you know, finger on the other end at the base, and I'd say, oh, well, I'll match there's a broomstick running between my fingers here. All right, so if I twist my fingers, you, know, you can see that water bottle is gonna rotate around that broomstick. So that water bottle is rotating around an axis. All right, um, same thing there, we can then stand the water bottle up and we can say, well, if, a water, if that broomstick's now going you know, through the sides of the bottle and I twist my fingers again, you can see that that water bottle is still rotating around the broomstick, but in a different way. All right, so the axis is aligned differently. Um, really basic because we're going to get more into that as the briefing progresses. Um, so you can see now we're kind of, we're, we're about what, 15 minutes into the briefing, the actual briefing itself, maybe a little bit less. All right, so at this point, you know, I'd probably want to start speeding up the brief just a little bit to make sure that it doesn't drag on too long. Uh, and we move on to slide number seven, which is the three axis of flight. So we're going to start off here by saying, so just like our water bottle had a broomstick that we could run, you know, through... Um, the the cap to the base or you know through the sides, the aircraft is the same. So the aircraft has three axes about which we can control movement, and they are the lateral axis, the longitudinal axis, and the normal axis. So we can see here that the lateral axis, the aircraft pitches around it, it's controlled by the elevator, and the pilot manipulates with the control column. So let's just start off with that top point there. So the aircraft pitches around the lateral axis. Well, again, we're going now from the known into the unknown. So we had a look at attitude. So in the definitions, we spoke about horizon, we spoke about attitude. 
So I'm just going to start off again, yeah, by using the model and popping it up on the whiteboard and saying, well, look at this, you know, the nose is on the horizon. I've put that nose on the line on the whiteboard. So we've got the broomstick that's running from wingtip to wingtip, all right, through what's called the lateral axis. Now, if I twist the aircraft, you know, around that broomstick, you can see that we have a nose high attitude if I twist it that way, or a nose, no, <laughs> a nose low attitude if I twist it the other way. All right, so now moving to the unknown again, that's controlled by the elevator. So once again, using the model, you know, we can hold that in front of the class. I can bring it up to you if we're one-on-one -on -one here and I can say the elevator is at the back of the aircraft here, you know, so you can see we have the wing, we have the fuselage, the empennage, the horizontal and the vertical stabilizer, and the elevator of these control services here right at the back. Now, what I, what I would like to impress upon the, the student at this point is one, the fact that the elevators move together. All right, so the, the elevators don't move independently of each other, you know, from one side of the, the tail to the other. They move in the same direction, right? Now Cessna 172 or our Cherokee. Uh, and, and as well, I'll just spend, you know, a quick minute here talking about uh, what direction the elevator is going to move to command a pitch either nose up or to command a pitch nose down. Uh, a really easy way that I found to kind of get students uh, remembering which way the control service has moved was to use the arrowhead technique. Um, and I can just use my pen for that. So if I move the elevators and I push those elevators uh, down on the model, I can then put my pen underneath up into where the elevator uh, connects to the horizontal stabilizer. And you can see it kind of creates an arrowhead pointing uh, back and up. All right, and that's the direction that the tail of the aircraft is going to move. The tail is going to go up, which means the nose is going to go down. All right, and, and again, then I can lift those elevators up. I can then put the pen uh, in again where the uh, elevator connects to the horizontal stabilizer, this time from above, because the arrowhead is pointing down, which means in this configuration, the tail will go down, the nose will pitch up. All right. Uh, and the final, the final point there is how, as a pilot in the cockpit, do I manipulate the elevator? How do I control the elevator? We do that with the control column. Uh, now, if the student is familiar with an aircraft, you know, we could obviously just kind of sit there and say, well, if I pull the control column back, the elevator is going to move in what direction, you know, and you can there play with the elevator, use the arrowhead technique. You know, if I push forward, you know, what's it going to look like? Um, if this is again, if this is their first kind of flight at all, uh, what we may need to do is we might grab a, a big picture of the cockpit of the aircraft out and we point out here is the control column, you know, you pull it back towards you, the aircraft pitches up, you push it forward, you know, the aircraft pitches down. Uh, the second one there is the longitudinal axis. So the aircraft rolls around this axis, controlled by the aileron, and it's once again manipulated with the control column. Uh, so for this one here, you know, once again, use the model, you know, I'll hold it from the spinner to the tail and say we've now moved that, broom, that broomstick from wingtip to wingtip, from nose to tail. If I twist that broomstick now, you can see what's happening. You know, if I twist it one way, you know, the left wing will go down as the right wing comes up. If I twist it the other way, the left wing will go up as the right wing will go down. Uh, this is controlled by the ailerons. And now we can have a look at the aileron. So these are these you know, control surfaces here on the outboard section of each wing. And they're different from the elevators, all right? These, these control surfaces don't move in unison. They move differentially. You know, one will go up, one will go down, depending on which way we want to roll the aircraft. Uh, once again, spend a little bit of time, or I would spend a little bit of time you know, with the student at this point talking about how we know which one's going to go up and which one's gonna go down, depending on you know, which way we move that control column. Uh, really easy again, we can use the arrowhead technique. All right, so if I roll the aircraft, if I turn the control column to the left, all right, that left wing is gonna go down. So what configuration of the ailerons you know, is gonna cause that to happen? All right, so if I want that right wing to go up, I'll push that left aileron down, I'll put the pen underneath, you know, oh look, there's our arrow pointing up, that wing is gonna go up. All right, which must mean you know the left aileron is going to be deflected upwards. All right, the pen is going to come in from the top. All right, that arrow is pointing down. Really, really basic at this stage. Uh, and then the normal axis, you know, or the vertical axis, uh, the aircraft yaws around it. It's controlled by the rudder. 
and the pilot manipulates with the pedals. Uh, so again, you know, we just the final the final movement of the broomstick uh, from the top to the bottom. Uh, the control surface, uh, which causes movement around that axis, is the rudder. So we'd have a look at it, you know, up here at the back of the aircraft. We have the rudder, uh, and once again, we can use the arrowhead technique. Let's say if I push the uh, or, or depress the left rudder pedal. All right, what way uh, will that rudder need to move? to cause a movement of the nose to the left. Uh, if I depress the rudder pedal to the right, what direction will the, the rudder have to turn or be you know, deflected to cause that movement? Uh, and then we move on to air deflection. So in this briefing, what we discuss as you know how an aircraft flies really basically and how these controls actually cause the movement um, around the axes, we just talk about air deflection. All right, so uh, as you can see, uh, the diagram that I used for it was really, really basic, and I draw this up on the whiteboard. So for me, this this slide wouldn't appear at all until after I'd drawn, you know, in front of the student, starting with nothing but a black line, you know, how air deflection works, how we get a total reaction, and the changes in lift and drag. So for me, this was a summary screen uh, at the end of the discussion. You know, but for now, we can just have a quick look at it. Um, so relative airflow, we have coming in here, represented by the blue arrows. We then have a flat plate, all right? So angled here, you know, at about 40 degrees. Uh, and then off the other side, we have lift, we have drag, and we have our total reaction. Uh, so the first thing is airspeed, all right? So we talk about airspeed. So how does that affect the size of this total reaction? Uh, so if we forget about this big triangle for a minute and just pretend we've got this little triangle here, all right, with the total reaction that goes to about there. So let's pretend we're driving down the highway, you know, 50 kilometers an hour, and I stick my hand out the window, you know, at a 40 degree angle like this. Uh, as we're driving along, you know, we then accelerate the car to 100 kilometers an hour, all right? Nothing changes but the speed, all right? Obviously, we're going to have more relative airflow. You know, so these arrows will either get longer, you know, we might be able to add more of them. However we want to represent it, doesn't matter. What we're trying to explain here is that as more air hits my hand, right, it's going to cause a larger total reaction, all right? So we're going to have an increase in the lift, we're going to have an increase in the drag, we're going to have an increase in the total reaction, all right, due to an increase in speed. Now, the next one to have a look at is angle. So this time, once again, I've got my hand stuck out the car window with my palm facing the, uh, the road, and we're driving down the road at 50 kilometers an hour. As I then turn my hand or twist my hand, you know, up to this, this 40 degree angle, you know, represented by the flat plate, right, what's gonna happen, you know, that hand is gonna go from kind of just being sitting there to trying to be pushed back to the top corner of the car window. All right, and then that, that's how I simply explain the effective angle. All right, that's an increase in the total reaction, causing your hand to want to be pushed back towards the top corner of that window. Uh, the third one, surface area. So surface area, uh, I, I've represented or basically described as, you know, you've got that hand out the window there, 50 kilometers an hour at that 40 degree angle. And then, you know, you bring your hand in, you decide to stick the boogie board out the window. All right, well, what's gonna happen? You know, your hand's gonna be there, you stick the boogie board out, or the boogie board's gonna be left behind somewhere down the Hume Highway. All right, because it's got a much larger surface area, it's gonna have a much larger total reaction. Uh, and the last one here, density. So density was always a little bit of a, a tricky one to kind of describe and explain at, at this level. Uh, and I did it uh, simply by using uh, a car once again, you know, as we're driving down the highway, uh, I've got my hand out the window and, you know, the, the, the force is pushing my hand to the top corner of the window. If I then took that car, right, and I took it to outer space, all right, because outer space, you know, the majority of people understand the fact that space is a vacuum. There's no air there, all right? If I'm driving my car through space and I stick my hand out the window, what's going to happen? Well, there's no, we're just going to kind of, it's just going to float there, isn't it? All right, it's going to float away. All right, so again, is it theoretically and technically correct? No, all right, but it works to kind of give the concept of density and how it affects the total reaction, all right? 
Um, moving right along to slide 10. So we're approaching kind of halfway here. We're 29 minutes into the, the presentation, probably about you know 22 minutes into the actual brief. Uh, now the primary controls. So we're moving into a kind of section of the brief now where I would start testing your knowledge. All right, because we're kind of getting back to things that we've already discussed and we're just adding little bits to them. So we've spoken about aileron and elevator and how they control pitch and roll already. All we're adding to it now is the fact that we call these things primary controls. All right, so when it comes here and it says the control column, the control column moves the ailerons, all right? And then, you know, again, this, this answer, so this section here wouldn't be up yet, all right? I'd just have the picture of the control column, you know, with control column written here. And I would say, all right, so if I move that control column left, all right, and deflect ailerons, what movement is that going to cause around, you know, or, or what axis is that going to cause movement around? And I'd be obviously looking for the, the student to say, oh, well, it's going to cause a movement, you know, around our longitudinal axis, you know, or, you know, maybe it will cause a roll about our longitudinal axis, you know, and that's perfect. That's really, really good. Uh, and I said, what if I pull back on that control column? You know, well, what's going to happen if I'm, if I'm sitting here, you know, and I'm looking at the horizon and the horizons, running through the nose of the aircraft, you know, and, I, and I'll pop the model back up on the board then, and I say, well, if I pull the control column back, you know, what's gonna happen to that nose? And they say, oh, it's gonna come up. Oh yeah, it is gonna come up. Uh, so that's a movement about which axis, you know, and then I can kind of do a little bit of probing. Ah, yeah, that, that's the lateral axis, you know, so it's a pitch, it's a pitch about the lateral axis. Uh, and then the rudder pedals, you know, so the rudder pedals, they move the rudder, you know, that's a yaw about which axis, you know, a bit of probing uh, about the vertical, the normal axis, you know, depending on, on what they want to call it. Uh, the next slide here is further effects of controls, you know, or secondary effects of controls. So when we do something, uh, when we make a movement about one of the axis, you know, with our primary controls, Unless we do something else, you know, there's going to be a secondary effect. All right, that's probably that's a terrible way of explaining it, but we'll and we'll get there. Uh, so the further effects of controls or the secondary effects of controls in regards to pitch. So what have I got written here? So when we move the elevator either up or down, we will induce a change in pitch. Correct. If we pitch up without a change in power, the aircraft will slow down. If we pitch down without a change in power, the aircraft will speed up. All right, so quite a simple concept. You know, one of the one of the, the skills of being a good instructor is to be able to explain the same concept 50 different ways. Um, because I read that, you know, and to me that makes sense and we move on. To you, it may not make sense. All right, and again, a good instructor will be able to pick up the cues that you don't understand. Um, you know, a more junior instructor may be able to do that through questioning. You know, a more senior instructor will be able to do that simply by looking at you, all right? We can tell when you don't get it. So a, another simple, you know, kind of analogy here to help with uh, to help with understanding this is what, back to the car again, everyone understands the car, you know? Some people don't like using the car analogies for, you know, uh, the total reactions and things like this. But, you know, everyone drives a car, um, everyone kind of understands where we're coming from with it. So if I'm driving down the Hume Highway, you know, foot flat to the floor, you know, 150 kilometers an hour, um, the car's not accelerating anymore, we're maxed out, all right? We then hit a hill. So we start climbing up that hill in our car. What's gonna happen to the speed, all right? Well, we can't maintain 150 kilometers an hour, all right, going up that hill, because that's all we could maintain on the flat ground. So we're gonna slow down, all right? Uh, the aircraft is no different. You know, if we're flying along in level flights, we're not climbing or descending, you know, full power, and then we pull back on the control column and we start climbing, all right, we're gonna slow down just like the car. Uh, so conversely, if we're back in the car on the Hume Highway, foot flat to the floor, 150 kilometers an hour, you know, we're barreling down, uh, and we see the big dipper coming up, all right? We've got a, a bit of a, a decline. As the, as the car starts going down the hill, all right, we notice the speed, you know, you know, 150, 155, 160, all right, the, the car will accelerate. And the aircraft, once again, is no different. If we have that aircraft, you know, full power in, in level flight, and we push that control column forward, and we pitch down, we are going to accelerate. 
So then we have, you know, the secondary effects of pitch. You know, so the primary effect of our elevator is a pitch up or a pitch down. The secondary effect is a change in airspeed, you know, and obviously a change in altitude. Uh, so the next slide talks about the further effects of controls or the secondary effect of roll. So when we move the ailerons, we induce a roll, correct? The secondary effect of a roll is a yaw in the same direction and the aircraft will tend to slip into the turn. Um, so we, in three briefings time, yeah, three briefings time when we talk about turning, all right, we're gonna tell you that when we roll an aircraft left, it's gonna initially cause a yaw to the right, followed by a slip to the left, followed by a yaw to the left. All right, so this is one of these slides that is kind of, it's in everybody's effects of control brief that I've ever seen. Um, and then in the turning brief, we kind of change the concept up a little bit more. So for me, it, it is an oversimplification of, of the concept, but we'll stick with it for now because this is most likely what you're gonna experience in your effects of controls brief. Uh, and all it's saying here is when we roll the aircraft left, all right, we know that, and again, this is where I'd start kind of probing for your understanding. You know, if I say, well, if I wanna roll left, which way are these ailerons gonna be deflected? You know, how would I command this, this this roll to the left in the cockpit? All right, so as we roll the aircraft left, you know, and for this one here, again, really, really basic. I just kind of stick my, my pen on the top of the aircraft, you know, through the through the roof here, you know, a little the pen sticking up this way. As we've rolled the aircraft left, you can see that, oh, that total reaction's kind of tilted into the turn now, you know, so what's that gonna cause? The aircraft is gonna kind of slip into the turn. All right, so it's tilted this way. So the aircraft's gonna slip down this way. All right, and then what's what's happening to our relative airflow then? All right, so we spoke about relative airflow. So when those wings were leveled, the relative airflow was coming straight over the nose, right? It was hitting the spinner. So this little bit just here, it was hitting the spinner and it was running straight down the length of the aircraft. All right, and straight over this tail bit, all right, straight around the tail. We've then rolled the aircraft to the left. We've tilted that total reaction slightly. All right, so remember the total reaction was coming kind of straight up the top of the wing, all right, straight up. Now it's tilted, all right, so it's, it's, like, the, it's like it's bolted to the top of the wing, all right, and as the aircraft turned, that total reaction has turned, all right, so we're kind of now slipping into the turn, all right, the total reaction, the total reaction, sorry, the relative airflow is no longer hitting the nose here. All right, the relative airflow is now hitting the side of the aircraft as we're slipping. All right, so you can see, well, what, what's what's sticking up the side here? It's a massive, look at the tail. It's quite big, isn't it? So as we as the airflow now strikes the side of that tail, it's going to try and push the tail out of the turn. All right, it's going to push it that way, which is going to cause the nose to yaw in the same direction as the turn. All right, so that is our roll followed by our slip, followed by our yaw. All right, and once again, that kind of concept will be built upon in the turning brief. Um, and because, yeah, that, that definition or that kind of description of how that all happens, uh, that was very, very basic and we'll, and we'll build upon that uh, in further briefs. Uh, further effects of controls, yaw. So when we deflect the rudder, we induce a yaw. The secondary effect of yaw is a roll in the same direction and the aircraft will tend to skid into the turn. All right, so when we deflect the rudder, we induce a yaw, tick. So the secondary effect of a yaw, of a yaw, of a yaw is a roll in the same direction. So all I used to do to describe this uh, phenomena is simply use the wings and to draw two circles. All right, so if I've got the aircraft uh, and I attach a pencil, to the end of each wingtip, you know, so I can draw a circle on the ground, and if, and then I twist the aircraft, let's rotate the aircraft 365 degrees and just draw some arcs. You know, you can see that if I yaw the aircraft to the left, all right, the arc drawn by the right wing or the outside wing is going to be longer than the inside wing. All right, so what it's saying there is that outside wing has a further distance to travel in the same amount of time, which is gonna mean it's traveling faster. All right, so if we think back to our, our uh, flat plate theory or our you know, total reaction, one of the factors that affected the size of that total reaction was speed. 
So if I am traveling faster, I'm going to increase the size of that total reaction. So the outside wing is traveling faster. So if you're to the left, the right wing is traveling faster. The size of the total reaction lifting that wing is now greater. So that wing will come up, all right, which is going to cause a roll, all right? So we think back, you know, if a wing is coming up, well, that's a roll, isn't it? So with your left, the outside wing, so the right wing has traveled further over the ground in the same amount of time, greater speed, greater total reaction, that wing is gonna come up. So a yaw to the left is followed by a roll to the left. So slide 14, so we've only got kind of eight slides to go now. We're 40 minutes into the, the presentation, so about 35 minutes into the brief. So the aircraft is in balance when the relative airflow is in line with the longitudinal axis. When in flight, we keep the aircraft in balance by stepping on the ball. So this is quite important, you know, it's an introduction to kind of making sure that your feet aren't asleep. All right, so the rudder pedals are the most forgotten about flight control. All right, because a lot of aircraft that you do your initial training in, you know, 172, the Cherokee, you know, anything kind of low power, slow, um, anything good for initial flight training, you can you can fly it without rudder pedals, all right, as long as it's got a nose wheel, really. Um, so, but then when you get into the more complex aircraft, the faster aircraft, you know, if you're flying something like a caravan, you know, you'll end up f keeping the aircraft in balance using the fuel tanks, the fuel indicators, all right? <laughs> because if you don't fly in balance, you end up burning the fuel out of one tank first. Uh, so it's important that when we're up in cruise, when we're doing different maneuvers, when we're transitioning, you know, between different stages of flight, you know, high power, low speed, you know, high speed, high power, all these different configurations that we keep the aircraft in balance. And we do that using a balance ball. All right. And then we just simply explain here, you know, that if the ball is out to the left, how do you center it? All right. You step on the ball. So if the ball is deflected out to the left here, you'll push on that left rudder pedal until the ball is centered. All right. If it's out to the right here, you'll push on or you'll step on that right rudder pedal until the ball is centered. Uh, now, an important point to remember here is that once you've pushed, you know, on that right rudder pedal and you've centered the ball, you've got to keep that pressure there, all right? Unless you've got rudder trim, you know, or unless you change the configuration of the aircraft, whether that be via power or airspeed, all right, you've got to keep that pressure in. If you release that rudder pressure, the ball's just going to go back out to the side. All right, so now we're gonna have a look at the effective airspeed uh, on the controls. So a change in attitude induced by a movement of the elevator will cause a change in airspeed. All right, so that's kind of what we already spoke about. We said, you know, a pitch, so we control by the, a pitch is controlled by the elevator, uh, which we move via the control column. The uh, primary effective elevator is a pitch, followed by, you know, a change in airspeed. So if we have, uh, and now, sorry, what we're gonna talk about is how much you have to move that control column to get the same change in pitch, you know, with varying air speeds. So we know that air speed or speed you know, is one of the factors that affect the size of the total reaction. Um, and, and each of these, these control services are essentially, you know, little mini aerofoils, little mini wings, all right? So the, the greater the air speed, the smaller the movement in, you know, anything like the angle needs to be to, you know, move that total reaction around. Um, so at a low air speed, the control services are going to be less effective and have a light feel. All right. So simply stated, we need to make a bigger movement of the control surface. We need to change that angle more, all right, to get the, the same amount of uh, pitch change as we would with a smaller movement at a higher airspeed. Uh, the reason they have a light feel is simply because our control surfaces are connected to the control column with, I, you know, with either you know, cables or you know, push rods. So we have a direct linkage to our control surfaces, so we feel that airspeed. So at a light airspeed, there's not much you know, resistance there to movement, so they're feeling very light, very sloppy, uh, and we need to make big movements of the controls uh, to get the aircraft to respond. Uh, at a higher indicated airspeed, those controls are more effective, all right? So simply meaning we have to make smaller control inputs uh, to get the uh, 
aircraft to respond uh, in the same way as we would need to put in larger control inputs at a lower indicated airspeed. Uh, the control surfaces then have a more firm feel, all right, because once again, you're now fighting against a higher uh, air airspeed or a higher relative airflow to move those controls. Uh, the effective slipstream. All right, so if we just quickly go back a slide, so we talk about the effective airspeed. This affects all of our control surfaces, all right? So this affects our rudder, it affects our ele elevator, and it affects our ailerons, all right? Now, slipstream. So the slipstream from the propeller flows rearwards around the aircraft in a, clock, in a corkscrew fashion. The airflow over the tail section is energized by the slipstream. It increases rudder and elevator responsiveness. All right, so this one here, you know, we talk about if, if you're sitting in the middle and you've got a friend either side on a hot day and I stick a fan right in front of you, all right, you're going to get the nice cool air where your friend's on the left and right, well, they're sitting outside, you know, they're sitting outside of that, that fan's slipstream. All right, so for this example, those two friends represent our ailerons. All right, they're out there sweating it out on the hot summer's day, all right, while you, Mr. Rudder and Elevator, all right, are receiving the benefit of the slipstream. Uh, now, the other thing to remember is your flight control surfaces don't care whether the relative airflow is coming via you know, forward airspeed or slipstream from the propeller. To them, airflow is airflow, all right? Uh, so what that means is that at a low indicated airspeed and a high power setting, you're gonna have quite a bit of responsiveness and quite a bit of effectiveness on your rudder and your elevator, whereas your ailerons are going to be extremely unresponsive and have a very light and very sloppy feel. All right, um, and that last point there is what we just spoke about. The slipstream effect is greatest at high RPM settings and low airspeed. So you know, on initial climb out after takeoff, you know, or in a configuration where you're setting up for something like your best angle of climb. Uh, which we will speak about in a later brief. Uh, the effect of power. So the engine produces power, which turns the propeller, and then the propeller, you know, produces the aerodynamic force of thrust, uh, which sends us hurtling through the air. Uh, power directly controls the strength of the slipstream. The more power, the stronger the slipstream. So the rotational airflow produces a yaw. So it's simply because, you know, the, the propeller isn't sending back a column of air, you know, in a uniform fashion. It's sending back a corkscrew of air, all right? So that twisting of air goes around the aircraft's fuselage then up the empennage and strikes the tail. And as you can see, if it's pushing the tail on that side, it's going to cause a yaw to the left. So as we increase the power of the aircraft, the nose is initially going to want to pitch up and the aircraft is going to want to yaw to the left. As we decrease power, the nose is going to want to pitch down and the aircraft is going to want to yaw to the right. Okay, so the reason why that happens is, you know, the aircraft is designed in such a way, and again, really, really basic, that it's gonna fly straight, it's gonna fly you know, true and in balance without you having to hold in a, a rudder input to keep that ball centered at a certain power and airspeed combination. And you know, without rudder trim or anything like that, that can only be at one power and airspeed combination, which generally is gonna be you know, built into the aircraft to be your, your cruise speed, where you're gonna spend the majority of your time. All right, you don't wanna have your foot you know, burnt into the rudder pedal there or buried into the rudder pedal for three hours while you're on cruise. All right, so that, that, that's why these increases and decreases of power uh, from that, that true setting, as I call it, you know, the, the setting where, you know, the tail is offset from center to allow for that slipstream, you know, at cruise speed uh, it will cause a yaw left or right, uh, depending on an increase or a decrease in power, and it'll cause a pitch up if you increase or a pitch down if you decrease power. Uh, what do we got here? So flaps. So then we're moving on to uh, flaps. When flaps are extended, they induce more drag and produce more lift. They are used for safer flight at slow airspeed, and they provide better forward, visi better forward visibility during approach and landing. 
All right, so again, there's more to flaps than what's gonna be discussed on this slide. This is the first flight you're going to be doing. All right, this is a really basic overview. Uh, now this table below that talks about extending and retracting flaps and what the aircraft pitch uh, result is gonna be is aircraft specific. All right, so in your aircraft, don't, uh, don't rely on the fact that extending flaps will cause an aircraft to pitch up it may pitch down, all right? This is very specific to the aircraft that we were flying. Uh, so pay attention in your brief, you know, for any specifics about that. Uh, then we have a look at the airspeed indicator itself. And we point out, you know, some of these color markings that are on here. Pardon me. So there is a maximum speed at which we can fly with flaps extended. That speed is called VFE. So this is the first time we would have seen what's called a V speed, V short for velocity, FE for flaps extended. So the velocity that we can fly with the flaps extended. Uh, in this example here for the Warrior is 103 knots and it's indicated by the highest speed on this inner white arc. So you can see this inner white arc here stops at 103 knots. So flaps should be retracted in stages due to the loss of lift as wing surface area is reduced. All right, so again, we're keeping this relevant to what we've discussed in the brief. All right, so we didn't discuss anything about camber or anything about it, you know, anything else other than surface area, speed, density, and angle early on. All right, so we're talking about here with flaps that, well, the flaps, all they're doing is that's the equivalent of replacing your hand, which is the wing, right with the boogie board out the window all right the flaps you know are lowering down like this it's putting more you know it's increasing the size of the total reaction for any given airspeed all right so we can fly slower while producing the same total reaction all right keeping it really really basic uh, and we've got to retract them in stages if we retract them all at once it's like bring that boogie board from fully out of the window to straight in all right that aircraft's going to sink all right, and I, show, and I actually, where we go up and fly, we'll have a play around with, you know, retracting the flaps and doing it properly, you know, versus doing it incorrectly. Uh, so you can see the danger that incorrectly retracting the flaps may pose in the event of something like a go around, you know, where we're low to the ground, we've tried to land, uh, we've decided, you know, we've, we've botched this landing, we're gonna go try again. You know, it's important that we retract the flaps in stages, not all at once, or we could end up sinking uh, back into the runway or back onto the ground. Um, okay, what have we got here? 19. So trim tabs. So trim tabs counteract an aerodynamic force. They act in the opposite direction to the primary control surface. There are fixed and adjustable trim tabs uh, and they are pretty much the poor man's autopilot. So unless you're at a really, really fancy school with a plane with an actual autopilot that, that works, uh, trim tabs are the closest thing you're going to come uh, to an autopilot until, well, it was the closest thing I came to an autopilot until well after my CPL. Actually, well, the first time I flew anything with a working autopilot was, a, was the caravan in Western Australia. That was a treat. All right. Uh, so it's important that from very early on in your training, you understand how to correctly trim an aircraft. Uh, you trim it and you, you, <laughs> it makes your life an awful lot easier. Uh, especially when you move on to, you know, even PPL navigation training, you know, there are students who get through their RPL and start their PPL training, who still can't trim an aircraft properly. And when you then add navigation, you know, a lot of heads down or head down time, you know, compared to what you're used to in the cockpit. Um, if the aircraft's not trimmed, you know, by the time they've, you know, looked in a map and kind of worked out where they are, you know, they've either climbed 500 feet, you know, or, or descended or whatever it might be. Uh, so there are two types of trim tabs, the fixed, so rudder, set to fly, all right? So what that means is sometimes you'll have a little a little metal plate that sticks out the back of the rudder, and what that is, that's set on the ground, so it's bent and pushed one way or the other, you know, to, yeah, again, keep that ball centered at a certain airspeed and certain power setting, all right? Uh, the second one is an adjustable trim tab, and for us, uh, that was only ever an elevator trim tab, uh, or in the Warriors and the, and the Pipers, sorry, you know, they sometimes had workable rudder trim. Uh, so the elevator and how we trim it. So if I'm pushing forward on the control column to stop the nose from coming up, 
what that's telling me is I have to trim forward. If I'm holding the control column back, so if I'm pulling the control column back, you know, to stop the nose of the aircraft from dropping, I need to trim the nose up. So if I'm sitting in the cockpit and I'm pulling that control column back and I have a trim wheel in front of me, I need to trim back, all right? So I need to start trimming the nose up until all of that pressure has been relieved or released from my hand and I can take my hands off the control column and the nose does not want to come up or down. Okay, so I spend quite a bit of time, you know, even on the ground here, you know, looking and pretending there's a trim wheel there and trimming and pointing out the really important fact that the trim wheel shouldn't move the nose. So you set the attitude with your control column and then you trim the pressure off your hands. All right, you do not move the nose with the trim wheel. All right, that's what your control column's for. Uh, slide 20, so we're getting to the tail end of it all now. Uh, so the throttle, so the throttle controls the amount of fuel and air going to the engine and it directly controls the amount of power produced. So in the Warrior here, you'll see that our throttle looks more like a you know, little throttle quadrant. In a 172, you know, it's the veneer type that comes in and out of the dash. And we set a power using an RPM in our light aircraft. So a cruise power setting in, in you know, a 172 or, or a Cherokee is going to be somewhere between 22, 2400 RPM. Uh, and we need to monitor... <coughs> Sorry, we need to monitor the engine RPM in flight to ensure the red line is not exceeded. So the red line found here is our maximum RPM all right, for safe operations. So I'm not going to go into any more about that at this stage. All right. uh, we're more likely to exceed the red line of the dive. So as we accelerate the aircraft, all right, we can actually increase the RPM of the engine. Moving the throttle forward will increase the RPM. Moving the throttle rearward will decrease the RPM. All right, so you push it forward to go faster, you pull it back to slow down. Uh, slide 21, the mixture control. So if the throttle can, if the throttle controls the amount of you know fuel and air going to the engine, the mixture controls the ratio of fuel to air that goes to the engine. So very, very simply and very quickly, you know, the internal combustion engine relies on three things to go bang. It requires fuel, it requires air, and it requires a spark, all right? So in compression as well, all right? So what the mixture does, the mixture controls the amount or the ratio of fuel to air that's going to the engine. So a rich mixture is when we've got this uh, red lever here pushed all the way forward. And that's going to be, you know, a lot of fuel to a little bit of air. A lean mixture, so when we start moving this red uh, lever back, it's called leaning the mixture. So it's going to reduce the ratio of fuel to air. Uh, when this red lever or the mixture lever is pulled all the way to the stop, all right, the engine will stop as it then cuts off all the fuel and we're just sending air to the engine. Slide 22. Carburetor heat, so if your aircraft does have a carburetor heat, generally, you know, there'll be a little slide on it here. And what it does is it controls the air source to the carburetor, uh, either atmospheric or heated. So heated air is used to melt ice if it is formed in the carburetor. It is also an alternate source of air for the engine. So if we have a blockage on our, uh, on our primary air intake, we can actually use the carburetor heat. We can turn that on uh, and we can bypass that. Uh, and it is use of carburetor heat will reduce the engine's performance. All right, so again, first lesson, you don't need to know too much about it. You just need to know that, you know, when we're doing our engine run-ups and we bring the carby heat on, we're expecting to see a drop in RPM. All right, really, really simply, really basic. We're going to be putting hot air into the engine. Hot air is less dense than cold air. All right, so we're actually going to be able to have less fuel, all right, because we have a less dense air, so we're going to have less of a bang. All right, really simple, and that's where we stop for this for this brief. Uh, and we move in now to kind of the last two slides, being airmanship and threat and error management. Uh, airmanship, does it have a constant definition? No, um, it's open to interpretation. And in the end, by the time you get your RPL, all right, I expect you to have your own definition of what airmanship means to you. All right, so the definition I've got here is airmanship is the consistent use of good judgment and well-developed skills to accomplish flight objectives. All right, so 
you know, really what it's about is about making sure that everything from your preparation for a flight to your conduct during the flight, all right, and even your self debrief after the flight, all right. So if you notice something that's unsafe, call it out, all right. If you don't feel well, you know, maybe today's not the best day to go flying, all right. But it's also about making sure that you have knowledge of the rules and the regulations, all right, because ignorance is no excuse, all right, for breaking uh, the rules or, you know, possibly causing injury or worse. Now, what we're going to talk about now is our lookout. So we have a uh, visual flight rules is what we're operating under for all of your RPL, which means we look outside the aircraft to make sure we don't hit anything. All right. And that involves, you know, hitting things like mountains, the ground, other aircraft or clouds. All right. So anything up in the air, you know, birds included. We look out, we see, we avoid. All right. So we do that using what's known as the ALAP cycle. So attitude, lookout, attitude, performance. Uh, A for attitude, you know, we're looking outside, making sure that the nose is where we want it in relation to the horizon. The L for lookout, well, we're going to look out to the left. We're going to look out in front. We're going to look out to the right. All right. And that's just looking for things such as traffic, things such as clouds, things such as birds, you know. Um, if we're in the training area, you know, things such as airspace, all right, the landmarks on the ground that kind of remind us, you know, what piece of airspace we're in. Uh, we then go back to the attitude, look out the front again, make sure the nose hasn't come up or down in relation to the horizon, and then we check our performance. All right, so we check things to make sure such as, <coughs> sorry, we check things such as our airspeed, our oil temperatures and pressures, you know, and make sure we're in balance, that we're maintaining the correct airspeed. All right, so all of these little things that we'll check as part of our scan going forward. Uh, then the last little bit to look at here is what's known as the clock code. So at all times, you know, uh, we're all gonna, we're both going to be looking out for traffic. So both myself and the student are going to be looking out for traffic. And if we see it, we call it. All right. So for example, if I'm sitting in the aircraft and I notice an aircraft straight ahead, all right, we're sitting here in the middle of the clock. There's an aircraft at twelve. All right, I call out traffic 12 o'clock, all right? If they're at the same level as us, you know, they're 12 o'clock level. If they are above us, they're 12 o'clock high. If they're below us, they're 12 o'clock low, all right? If you're sitting there and you look out as part of your scan and you see an aircraft, you know, out to our left here about 10 o'clock at the same altitude, you will call out traffic 10 o'clock level, all right? Um, we get, we'll get to a stage, you know, where you make a decision then. Well, is that 10 o'clock level traffic a threat or not a threat? All right, so uh, meaning are they conflict to us or is, is are they no conflict to us? Um, if the aircraft is a conflict, so it's flying towards us and you think that, you know, there could be an issue, we'll call out traffic 10 o'clock level conflict. All right, well, then I'll look out. Now I'll say, oh, yeah, traffic sighted. All right, and then we'll say, oh, well, how are we going to avoid conflict? You know, maybe we make a turn one way or the other. Maybe we climb, or maybe we stop climbing or descend or whatever. All right, uh, when looking for traffic, we use a methodical scan. All right, so we use, it's called the saccade cycle. Now, so we look uh, across the window, kind of 10 degrees up and down at a time. Your instructor will go through that with you. Uh, we report traffic cited by referencing its position on a clock face. We've just discussed that as the clock code. And we always know who is in control. So handing over, taking over. All right, so only one person can be flying the aircraft at a time, whether it is you or me. Uh, so we use the handover, takeover technique. So if I'm flying the aircraft and I want to hand over to you, I'll say handing over. Uh, then what I'm expecting for you to do is to make sure that both your feet are on the rudder pedals and your left hand is on the control column. All right, and then you will say taking over. At that point, you know, I'll then make sure I'll remove my hands from the controls and you'll be flying. Uh, if you are then ready to hand over to me, you know, you will say handing over. You'll make sure that I have my hands and feet on the controls and I'll say taking over. All right. Or if I need to take control off you, I'll say taking over. All right. And then you'll remove your hands and, uh, from the controls, you know, rest your feet lightly on the rudder pedals is fine uh, and say handing over. The last slide here is threat and error management. 
So we have a quick look here at a couple of threats that could be relevant to the, the lesson. And the first one is the threat of conflict with traffic. Now, what would cause that threat to become an actual you know, issue is the error of an ineffective lookout. So, you know, we're in, in the plane here, we're having a look at the primary effects of some controls, we're engaged in conversation, you know, the fact that, you know, very easy to forget about that lookout, uh, and then the management for that threat to make sure it doesn't happen is, you know, that we maintain that ALAP cycle, that methodical scan. Uh, the second threat is, you know, not knowing who is in control. So that's where it's important that we have, you know, good two-way communication in the cockpit, all right? So ineffective communication is the error. Uh, and the management is we're always going to use that handover takeover method. Uh, a threat of an uncommanded yaw. So the error is not flying in balance. All right. And the management is keeping the ball centered. I don't really like those three. All right. Again, they came straight off my sheet many years ago. Um, but it, it is what it is there. They kind of, they're not wrong. They're just not the greatest threats, errors, or managements I've ever seen. Uh, a couple of things to remember here, just as we're finishing up. So we're at an hour five total. Uh, so about, you know, a 55 minute brief. So again, you know, I ramble and, and carry on a little bit. And I go off on tangents and, and this is what happens. Uh, so threat and error management is a part of everything we do. So it's important to remember that. Um, everything we do is about either, you know, removing threats or, you know, having a management technique to mitigate the threat. All right. Uh, so a threat is something that can be either, it can be either inside or outside the cockpit. So it's important to remember that threats are internal or external. Uh, an internal threat would be something like you or me, all right? It may be something like, you know, the fact that it's a really cramped cockpit, all right? Or, you know, in the fact of a high wing aircraft, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to see into the turns. We have to kind of lean forward and make sure that when we're turning, we're clearing uh, the turn. An external threat is something that's happening outside the aircraft. Uh, so it could be other traffic, it could be a weather threat, you know, it could be birds, it could be air traffic control. All right, so you can see there's a lot of things that can be classified as threats, uh, and we can either, you know, mitigate them or we can remove them. Uh, and the error is something the pilot has or has not done to mitigate the threat. All right, so if we have a mitigation technique in place, so let's say the threat is the fact that we're flying a high wing aircraft and when we're turning, you know, to the left, let's say, you know, you have a bit of trouble seeing into the turn. All right, so we can't remove that threat. You know, we can't take the wings off. All right, I guess you could fly a low wing, but we'll, we'll pretend we're assessing a man or, or girl for the time being. Um, so, you know, the mitigation for that is going to make sure we're going to lean forward and we clear that turn and we look into the turn. So the error there may be, you know, the fact that you, you've become complacent, all right? You haven't cleared the turn, you know, you're not following the correct, you know, process during the turn. Um, and obviously, you know, we then don't know what we're turning into. Uh, so the final slide is a recheck of the objectives, all right? So this here is to make sure that, you know, as the student, you've followed, followed along in the brief and you've actually absorbed some of this knowledge. So the first one identify the flight controls and their axis of movement correctly. So just it could be something as simple as, you know, the instructor handing you the model and going through this saying, oh, which ones are the ailerons? You know, if I want to roll to the left, which way are they going to go? Oh, very good. You know, so what axis is that moving about, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that kind of then covers off the second one as well. I would cover the first point here and the second point just using the model. Uh, describe how control effectiveness varies with airspeed. So if I'm flying really, really fast, you know, um, the elevator, for example, you know, I might ask you, is the elevator going to be effective or, you know, less effective at a higher airspeed? You know, are we going to have a firm feeling on the controls or, you know, is it going to be a bit sloppy? Uh, state correctly from memory the purpose and use of flaps, trim, and carburetor heat, you know, if applicable. Uh, so this one here, you know, Again, I wasn't really happy with this objective. So, you know, just asking you now, you know, so if we're using flaps in the aircraft that this briefing was based upon, you know, if we're extending the flaps, you know, are we expecting a pitch, a nose pitch up or a nose pitch down? You know, so I'll just be saying, oh, it's going to be a nose pitch up. You know, off. so if we're retracting the flaps, you know, why is it important that we retract them in stages and, and, and not all at once? You know, and all I've been looking for there is an answer somewhere along the lines of, Oh, because, you know, as we retract the flaps, we're going to lose that lift, so we can, we're going to experience a sink. So it's important that we control that sink by removing the flaps or retracting the flaps one stage at a time. Uh, and the final one here, 
Uh, what are the four factors that affect the total reaction? You know, we'd just be looking at you know speed, angle, density, and surface area. All right, so that's it for the long brief today. So we're about an hour ten. So I've blown it a little bit here time wise, um, but again, I have rambled on. So for me, you know, this is the, again the first time I've looked at this briefing in a very very long time. Um, there's some things I would change about it. Uh, the the contents there, you know, the the, the boxes have been ticked. Um, but again, it comes down to the delivery of the brief more than anything, um, and that's that's why again going back to the first video podcast or the first podcast uh, where it's so important to pick the right flight school and the right instructor. Um, because I could give this slideshow to a monkey, you know, and train a monkey to, you know, press the button to go through the slides. Uh, but you're not actually going to learn anything from a slideshow. You're going to learn from the instructor. Uh, so the next podcast will be based on your second RPL flight, which will be straight and level. So before then, uh, first of all, you know, go up and enjoy the effects of controls flight. Have an excellent, uh, an excellent time. It's a big moment. Uh, it's the first time, your first step on the journey to your license. Um, so before the next podcast, if you can have a bit of a read through the textbook uh, for the second flight, have a look at the uh, the lift formula, uh, both the engineers and the pilots lift formula, and I'll see you back here next time. Thanks guys.